Hey everybody, it's Devin. And Kate. Welcome to Med Crimes. That was melodic. I know. everybody listen i'm loving this <laughs> we are we are getting fancy down we kind here. of our our patreons thank whatever gods or goddesses are out there that we have them because we're able to afford these like nice little upgrades here and there and now we have like this fancy partition that was kind of a bitch to set up and i definitely broke a nail but it's fine because we sound really good i didn't break a nail at all i was yeah. rugged as shit yeah as usual i was on it <laughs> Devin is rugged as shit as a general rule. I'm loving this. There's hard vibes. And you want to know why I, I'm also excited? I am also excited because we are introducing our first ever series of episodes. Whoa. And it's going to be a wild ride, you guys. Wow. Yeah. The Dr. Satan series. Dr. Satan. Mm-hmm. Whoa. So. This sounds scary as shit. It is scary as shit. He's one of the worst people to ever exist, and I know we say that a lot, but he, for real though, is one of the worst people to ever He's exist. Satan. He's Satan. He literally earned the name Dr. Satan for because he was very Satanistic. That's gross. Isn't it Satanic? Satanic. Satanic, okay. Yeah. I Thank mean, he you. wasn't Thank literally you. Satanic, but this happened back in like the 1940s, 1950s, and <sighs> they kind of just associated it with... Dr. Satan. But before we get to that, we have business. Oh, I love the business part of the job. I know. We have Patreons. I love Patreons. We have de new people. And de. you're going to notice that I'm going to be very like French pronounced. This is all like this whole story is happening in France and there's a lot of like French pronunciation. So you I'm like trying in that to vibe. get ready for that bougie vacation you just to- told me about. <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys saw, um, like, on the Miss Universe pageant, they, for whatever reason, had all the contestants from all the different countries, like, come up to the microphone and introduce themselves and then, like, just yell the country that they were from. And the lady that yelled France went viral because of how fucking funny it I guess I'm going to have to look this up. Please do. She literally walks up to the microphone. She goes, France! <laughs> so funny. So anyway, yay, France! for that um so we have two new patreons we have trisha earl i'm so excited for this patreon oh devin clearly knows her personally trisha thanks girl okay trisha okay we love you okay girl (laughs) okay i see you all right and then we have aaron gear Ooh, aaron get it in gear (laughs) so you guys are fancy little pixies that hop around in the fields and fuck shit up and then walk away because playing your piccolo you're playing piccolos you're pixie piccolos you are but you're also um super sexy about the whole thing it's great yeah so thank you aaron and trisha welcome to the family welcome to the family i feel like we need to get ready we've had a slew and we're in season two so we haven't done a season two patreon giveaway we should do that. I think it's getting about time. Okay. It's getting yeah. about time. So you guys hang on to your pantaloons. We're going to let you guys know. <laughs> we're going to do a Patreon giveaway. <laughs> so if you want to join in on the fun, it's not too late. It is not Get too in late. now. Get Our giveaways are there. pretty cool shit. They they are for real the best. And they're so fun to like do. And we just love sending people shit. We give away stickers. There's free t-shirts. It's like so fun. Just like, just come. We did a bag. Us- We've done yeah. coffee cups. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's been so fun. We got to do more. Anyway, coming down the pike for you Patreons. Because we love ya. We love ya faces. Dr. Satan. Dr. Satan. So. Dun, dun, dun. We are going to do this in a minimum of three parts. There's a lot of information to pour over here. I've been really pouring my heart and soul into this particular case for the past lots of hours, and it's been kind of draining, but I think I've got it sort of narrowed down to three-ish episodes, but we're going to create a little bit of a series about this because it's just so much. 
Okay. Um, and just as an intro, we're going to be talking about Dr. Marcel Petio. 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 And Dr. Petio was a French physician and serial killer who has earned himself the nicknames um, the Vampire of the Rue Le Sur, or the New Bluebeard, and simply the Monster. And of course, Dr. Satan was the most po- widely used nickname that he earned himself. So over these three episodes, you are going to give us the details as to how such a person gets these disastrous names? No. Oh, of so course, we're done. That's why we're here. Yeah, okay, I'm going to do that. <laughs> I mean, those are pretty (laughs) grueling names. Yes, they are. So um, he actually had been convicted of killing 23 people prior to his apprehension back in 1944, but is suspected to have killed at least 60 people. Oh, my goodness. Um, This case, and we don't get into a whole lot of gore and the nitty gritty in this episode. We're going to talk a little bit about his upbringing, his schooling. Uh, his background and his behavioral characteristics and a little bit of an intro into when he settles into his career and how things start to transition. Um, In like other episodes, this is mm-hmm. where you get me to like him or um, You're not gonna feel like him. bad for him. And We're then not going to feel bad fan. for him. Yeah, this this guy we never really quite feel bad for. Maybe Good. Maybe at one point you think you do. But you really don't need to feel bad for him. <laughs> um, so I'm going to issue a trigger warning for the series, and I'll talk about it a little bit more when we get more into the murders um, and the bulk of the murders, which is going to be um, probably the next episode is when we're going to really start getting into that. But this whole case does talk um, extensively about mental illness. Some of his victims do include children, although we're not going to get into that this episode animal cruelty Ugh. and um, military stuff if that's a trigger for some of you as well so i will give a warning prior to getting onto the more brutal and graphic parts and again we're really not getting into we're going to talk about a couple of murders but we're not going to get into like the child stuff and the more brutal stuff until the next episode but and i will give you a warning before that as well um but as always We will try to do this with the utmost respect for the victims and their memory as we can. Absolutely. So with that said, we will start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. Thank you. I was hoping you would do that. I'm an extension of you. This is true. She's like my arm. (laughs) She's my third and fourth arm. All right. Brace yourself. There's a lot of French shit coming up. So this guy's full name was Marcel André Henri Félix Petiot. You did that very well. Thank you. And mom, if you're listening, you're welcome. I did have to look all that up to make sure I did it right. Kate's mom is very French. Yes, she is. Hi, mom. Can I go on that vacation with you, by the way, mom, (laughs) if you're listening? I also, (laughs) I can leave everyone else at home. (laughs) Just Devin. Just the Devin would be great. So, um, Dr. Petio was born January 17th, 1897 to parents Felix Petio, who was a postal worker, and Martha Marie Petio. The couple lived in a home in Auxerre, France, which is a small town that had been around for about a million years and had like this tiny little population. It was a very close-knit community. Auxerre is located about 100 miles south of Paris, just for geographical reference um he did have one brother maurice whom was born when marcel was 10 so he was quite a bit older than him um now there are tons of stories that have floated around over the past century about this guy's youth and upbringing for people that grew up close to him and people theorize that a lot of this was actually kind of made up Because once his terrible shenanigans were discovered, you know, they people were trying to scramble to offer some kind of explanation for his crazy behavior. But unfortunately, there's not always an explanation. When bad things happen, they find they try to find a way where they how they were connected. Well, exactly. You you always get bits and pieces. Exactly. You try to rationalize like how how could this man have done all of this to another human being something so terrible must have happened and we're going to talk about some 
I have a personal theory, and we're going to talk oh. a little bit about it. Will you share later? Of course, I will. Of course, no. I will. We'll talk about oh, it in this episode. It's all part good. of the all part of the good stuff. So some of these stories were pretty extravagant. A lot of them were centered on how he treated animals and other children. Trigger warning here for animal cruelty. Uh, one story described that the neighbor's cat wandered into their house one day when Marcel was a child, and that Marcel reportedly tortured and then suffocated the cat in his own bed oh yeah again was this made up did this actually happen we're not 100 percent sure Mm -hmm. but if we talk about his behavior you know going forward it kind of would make sense and these are kind of the early signs of what i think is going on which is like aspd so another story described that he would like go out and find bird nests and pluck oh, no. baby birds oh, no. out of their nests. Oh. This is really bad. And oh. he would poke their eyes out <gasps> with a needle and watch them fly around blindly in a cage. Which, like... I'm is cringing. The, it, it is. It just makes your, like, skin... It's, it's just, like, one <gasps> of the horrible... How can you take, like, a tiny little living being that's so innocent and just totally you know, tor- torture the shit out of the poor thing. Oh, boy. Yeah. See, we don't have to like this guy. No. It's fine. Nope. That's gone. <laughs> All these accounts are very disturbing. Again, based on what happens later in life, it would not surprise me if these were true, but we can't say for sure that that all those stories are alleged. Now, apart from these disturbing accounts, there are also reports of profound intelligence at a very young age. Um, reportedly his schoolmasters would recall that at age five, he could read at the level of a 10 year old easily, wow. just like read, you know, chapter books and like mm-hmm. really big, long words and stuff that no five year old could really typically do. He also excelled in mathematics and was just grade levels ahead of where, of his classmates in all of these subjects. Um, he did, however, have a lot of trouble making friends. He was a bit of a loner. And many of his interactions with people were reportedly of him making them feel very uncomfortable or even attempting to harm them. So my mind is going right now to spectrum. Yeah. Yep. Right. So yeah. social issues. It's entirely possible because he's having all these profound social issues. Another thing I was thinking, and a lot of his later behavior kind of supports it, is that he has like antisocial personality disorder. He's like he's yeah. a psychopath. Yeah. Um, we'll go with that one. Well, I, I, I mean, either one of those, mm-hmm. really. Um, and it's hard because, like, we didn't know him. And, you know, the and a lot of these things are just that. They're just stories. And we right. don't know for sure. So, for example, he was at one point in his life caught passing around obscene pictures and drawings to his classmates. He was even apparently hypersexual at a very young age. Um, and would proposition his young classmates regularly, boys and girls. Um, this alone, like wow. if today, any like most educators, parents, this would set up alarm bell bells. But Something like, is very also, wrong. In this time period, where did he get that information? It's not like he had Google. Exactly. I mean, you're talking 1910. So, mm-hmm. And I'm glad you said that, Devin, because that kind of brings me into my theory. And I have a theory. And again, just a theory, but based on the evidence, and we'll get a little bit more into it, that he was sexually abused at a young age. Yeah. Like, yeah, he, he had to have been exposed to it somehow. Yes. Because you don't just have the World Wide no. Web. And he just is going to school and going home. So... All these other young children aren't giving him this information. Mm -hmm. So where else is he getting it? For me, like I said, is kind of screaming antisocial personality disorder or some kind of autism spectrum disorder or maybe a combination. For sure. With his overall behavior, his, you know, clear lack of empathy. If those animal torture, you know, things are true. His hypersexuality, it also makes me wonder, like I said, if he was abused at a young age, it would make a lot of sense. Um, There are no direct reports of this, although, as we know, in this time period, you know, that was often just totally swept under the rug, even if people did know about it. Oh, my God, for a long time to come. Yeah, and there there was so much shame associated with it. So 
ASPD often affects people who are sexually abused at a young age as a way to sort of dissociate from reality. And, you know, that's how they sort of cope with that trauma so that they don't form meaningful relationships with people. And the rest is kind of just, you know, the fallout from that. Mm -hmm. It's just so sad. And as he gets older, his behavior towards his classmates starts to grow more violent. At age 11, 11, he was in a classroom studying African civilization when he interrupted the class by pulling out a pistol and firing (gasps) around into the ceiling. Oh, my God. Yeah. That same year, though, at age 11, um, one day, instead of going out for recess, he pinned a classmate to a door at the end of a hallway and was caught throwing knives into the door frame around him with, quote, astonishing accuracy. The precision. The precision. Oh, my gosh. Just, like, really disturbing stuff. Eleven. Just, I'm eleven, and I'm just going to throw knives at you because I don't understand the or care about the consequences of my actions. There were also reports that he was a terrible sleepwalker. He slept walked all the time, and he would also have issues with bedwetting into his early teens. Another sign of sexual abuse, I'm just saying. Oh, so I don't think I realized that one. Yeah. And it's interesting, too, because because we're talking over 100 years ago, like age 11 was almost at that point too a young man. Yes. Like many men only went to school till say to age 12 or yes. 14, right? 100%. And then started working. And yes. So, you know, it's maturity wise, typically in a, in a normal 11 year old mm-hmm. back 100 years ago would be much more seen as mature and older than yes. our current 11 year olds. Yes. 100%. Yes. So it's You're interesting right. that some people might see him almost as a man. Yeah. And then these are the things that he's doing. You're totally right. You're totally Ugh. right. I know. So his parents take him to get seen by the family physician at one point because they're like, we don't know if this is a medical issue. Like, he's behaving weird. He's sleepwalking. He's peeing the bed into his, like, early teens. Like, what's going on? But back then, you know, what was understood really about ASPD and the signs of it, and doctors really didn't have much to offer other than hopefully this is a phase and it's going to get better. That's kind of what they did back then. Right. In 1912, he was 15 and his brother Maurice was five. His mother Martha passes away. Oh no. Following her death, their father accepts a job at the post office in Joani, which is a village about 15 miles away from where they currently lived in Auxerre. He wanted the two boys to be able to stay in their respective schools to finish out the year at least. So their father goes to move to Joanny for this new job. And the boys move in with their aunt Henriette, who's Martha's sister. So they are staying in Auxerre to finish out their school year and to stay in their schools. Their father is no longer living with them. They are staying with their mom's, with their late mother's sister, if that makes sense. With their aunt? Yes, with their aunt. So before the end of the school year, though, Marcel was thrown out of his school anyway for continued behavioral issues. So... Which I'm sure only got worse. Oh, yeah, yeah, and they do. Oh, yes. And that's why we're sitting here talking about him today. So ultimately, he ends up leaving Auxerre and he goes and moves in with his dad in the new town that he moved. He had moved to Joani after he gets thrown out of school. And no surprise, he enters school there, immediately thrown out for behavioral issues. This kid just like cannot stay in any. He has a big problem with authority. He cannot stay in any sort of program. Um, so now he's 16, 17, not in school because he's been thrown out of two schools and he has nowhere else to go and he has nothing but time on his hands. So he starts getting himself into more and more trouble. His criminal career kind of begins around here. Um, he starts doing like little petty shit, like he starts stealing mail from people's mailboxes presumably just trying to get a hold of like some checks or some money um, or even just sensitive personal information. He, of course, was caught, <clears throat> excuse me, and charged with ja- with damaging public property and mail theft. This was in 1914. Now, at this time in France, 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 
<laughs> Sorry, but now at this time in France with young offenders around his age, the French courts would often have the offenders examined by a psychiatrist if the circumstances were a bit unusual. And for him, you know, due to his past behaviors and the fact that he had been thrown out of school a couple of times, the courts opted to have him examined by a psychiatrist. On March 26th of 1914, the courts appoint the court appointed psychiatrist found Marcel to be quote an abnormal youth suffering from personal and hereditary problems which limit to a large degree his responsibility of his acts end quote. Due to this determination his theft and destruction of property charges were dropped he was deemed essentially legally unable to be held responsible for his own actions. Then I feel like fine he can't control his own actions shouldn't be legally held to it but then something has to be in place like a guardian that can actually be like you can't do this shit. yes well i know and you like know, now but... we have those systems in place mm -hmm. back then it doesn't really seem like they did because i didn't really see anything that said he was then put into the custody of blah 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 he like, was kind of me, just left to out in the world to do would whatever that be like when people now use a case of insanity you know, like they they don't have the mental capacity to exactly. know the consequences of what they were doing. Exactly. So they can't be held responsible. Exactly. But they probably didn't have this back in. Right. Yeah. So he was kind of like deemed unfit to stand for his own, you know, actions, but also just set free, set free and let to just continue to doing conti it. Continue now knowing his that he's not going to face punishment. Exactly. That screams danger. Yes, 100% it does. Now, how does he become a doctor? <laughs> you just wait. How it's do we wild. get from this point to doctor? <laughs> it's fucking wild. It's <laughs> wild. Now, his father, Felix, was completely fed up with Marcel's shenanigans at this point. So he, his dad had been dealing with his whole life with these behavioral issues. And all of a sudden, he's in trouble with the law. And he, you know, can't be held accountable for his own decisions. And so he's like floored. That his son's behavior was not, you know, just a phase and it is continuing into adulthood. And he's like, at this point, Felix Petio wanted nothing more to do with his son. So subsequently, he sent his son to complete his studies to a special school for the, and this is not my term, this is their term. This was a special school for the, quote, mentally ill, end quote in Paris. Um, so this was in 1915 that he was sent there to hopefully complete his degree or get some schooling done in this special school. It sounds like he didn't have a whole lot of options and this was something no. that like at least you could be with people that are may potentially like you. Yeah, exactly. And maybe you maybe can get some treatment. Exactly. Like it, it's, it doesn't sound like a terrible idea thus far. You know, it doesn't sound like that was the worst idea. He finishes out his primary schooling. So he essentially, like, the equivalent today would be graduating from high school. He finishes that out at this special school in Paris. Despite his record of being formally deemed, quote, mentally ill, again, not my term, and irresponsible for his actions by a court of law, he was inducted into the 89th Infantry Regiment in January 1916 and sent to the front line in november of that year so not a very good <laughs> screening process it's not i think it was more an issue of you are a man with a pulse and we so fucking need you we don't give a you. fuck yeah mm -hmm. is it world war one I? I think world war one that is confirmatory <laughs> confirmed by the googleizer world war one so he's inducted and in, essentially drafted into the military he serves there until 1917, so he's been there for about two years, when he suffered an injury from shrapnel that essentially ripped open his left foot. He was sent to the military like medical clinic, where he convalesced for a short period of time, but there he was exhibiting signs of mental illness. These were observed by you know the medical workers, the staff that worked there. He was transferred to convalescent homes for a brief period before he was thrown back onto the front line, but he eventually was thrown right back onto the front lines. He was hospitalized again shortly after that just for behavioral issues and signs of mental illness. 
I don't know exactly what was done, what he did here. Um, this led to an evaluation by a psychiatrist who then diagnosed him with, quote, mental disequilibrium, neurasthenia, depression, melancholia, obsessions, and phobias. That's quote. a lot. That's a lot of diagnoses. The determination was made again by a different psychiatrist that he could not be legally held responsible for his actions. It's unclear what diagnosis this equates to with this day and age that they made for him. Maybe bipolar disorder with psychotic features or something similar. So what it seems like in this moment, based on his behavior, is that he is suffering heavily from some kind of mental illness. And which, of course, at this point in time, there was no real medical treatment for. You know, we didn't have medications back then to treat any of this stuff. Of course, these things were are way better understood now on a chemical level, but back then, you join the military and hope for the best. Now, despite just recently having been deemed once again to not be able to be held accountable legally for his actions, he was returned to the front line. I don't like this. He Maybe they wanted this mentality in a world war, though. Well. Someone, like, unleash the demon, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Maybe, or maybe they just really needed warm bodies for the front line. Yeah. Maybe they just thought because of his issues, this guy's disposable. Teach him how oh. to work a machine gun. Yeah. And he's, and, you know, uh-huh. he's not that valuable to us, which uh-huh. is very sad to say, but I think that was probably could have been, could have been true. a strategy. Yeah. So... He was returned right back to where he was on the front line. Unfortunately, he was he appeared to have suffered some kind of psychiatric episode or nervous breakdown at one point in which he fired a pistol into his foot. What? So he was again removed from the front lines, brought to the recovery. Purpose. Yes. Once he recovered, of course, he was returned right back to where he was on the front lines again. So He's now on the mil- you know, in the military on the front lines during World War II and in what seems to be a very traumatic scenario for him because what he's exhibiting, it seems like it's triggering some kind of like massive psychiatric situation. So it's taking all of these existing issues if they're there and just kind of like lighting them on fire essentially and absolutely causing a complete meltdown of his existing mental health. It's at this time that he begins suffering from seizures. Um, It's unclear if he had an actual seizure disorder. I did um, read a book about this gentleman, and a few times in this book they do mention the term epilepsy. So I will infer from that that at some point he was formally diagnosed with epilepsy. The book I got a lot of my information from is called The Unspeakable Crimes of Dr. Petio by Thomas Mater. And it's a wonderful read if you want a lot of details about the uh, nitty gritty of his life and a lot of the relationships that he had and didn't have and a lot of personal conversations with the guy, like accounts of personal conversations. It's really interesting. So... I'm not sure if these were pseudo seizures or psychogenic of some kind, um, but in September of 1918, he was actually hospitalized due to compul- convulsions. And upon his discharge, he was sent to the 91st Infantry Regiment um, as a machine gunner. Imagine that. Yeah. Great candidate for that. Uh-huh. Um Of course, he was soon hospitalized once again for another psychiatric episode. And finally, a psychiatrist there recommended discharge from the army. Thank you. Finally. Thank you. So in March of 1919, he was finally discharged neither honorably or dishonorably. It was a medical discharge from the army. And when he was discharged from the army, he was given a 100% disability. And he was also given a pension for his service. Back then, you got a pension if you served in the military. And that was custom back in the day. Do. I, do you? Great. You have. You might have to hit a certain year's like retirement. Maybe. Hit your 20-year mark. That makes sense. Yep. But yes. Perfect. 
So I could be wrong on that. Definitely have to. Let us know if you guys know. I it know, would make sense. I know it's still out there. Yeah. Um, so at this point, over the next several years, he's having a lot of trouble living on his own. He spends some time in psychiatric facilities. This alone must have been traumatic, as we all know what places like that were like back in the day. They were not treatment centers. They were, you know, at least 90% of them were filthy prisons yeah. that were torture chambers, oh. essentially. So he had a lot of trouble finding and holding down a job. Um, but he was collecting his pension, so he did have a little bit of money. Now, remember, he may be struggling with his mental health at this point, but he is extremely intelligent and extremely adept. And there was a program back then that offered military veterans an accelerated medical training. Oh, boy. Now, having really nothing else to do with his time and, you know, no future, he goes ahead and enrolls. Within eight months of beginning this program, eight months, he is launched into an internship at a psychiatric hospital. And in 1921, he receives his medical degree. So when you say accelerated, (laughs) zero to 60, (laughs) mentally ill to a doctor. Yeah. Done. In eight months of classroom school and one internship. He receives his medical degree. So there were some suspicions when officials, after his arrest and such, kind of looked back on his schooling records. They kind of poured over things really carefully, and they thought they might have found some documents that he might have falsified in order to further accelerate his program. Uh Uh-oh. It's, like, not real clear on this, just so you know, but that's a thing that they did find. It was kind of a maybe situation. So, in literally less than a year, this guy has gone from being an outcast in and out of psychiatric facilities to having been deemed unable to be held accountable for his own decisions legally to being an actual physician. To Dr. Petio. What a fucking time to be alive. Just saying. So, of course, he now has this, like, new lease on life. You know, he finally has this focus and, you know, the numbers and the math and the science and the data of it all is stuff that he really is you know genuinely very gifted with and he's very very good at all that so now people who were close to him at the time such as classmates of his you know had recalled that very early on that he might have really only wanted the position to be able to wield power over people and have that sort of life or death decision making power like on any given day and they just it kind of he his attitude towards patients kind of struck them in that way. So it was a way for him to, you know, kind of play God without having to actually throw knives at people like he had to in his childhood. So remember his dad, Felix? Hi, Dad. Who disowned him and essentially abandoned him to suffer from his mental illnesses alone in psychiatric hospitals? Or didn't know how to help his son because he's a widow dealing with his grief and everything is out of his control. So sent him to where he felt best fit. Okay, so Devin is playing devil's advocate and she has a super strong point. You're right. I'm sorry, Felix, that I spoke. Unless he sexually you. abused him, like your theory says, he, and then you, you know, you also might be a pedophile. So you know, the jury's out on you. So the results of the potential sexual abuse determines which side we go with. Yes. Anywho. Anywho. Continue. Now, he hears his screw-up son is now a doctor. Doctor. And changes his tune completely, of course. He just reinserts himself back into Marcel's life and, of course, is apologetic and he's praising him. And there was something I read about where Marcel, like, was invited to dinner with his father so he goes to dinner the two dine together and marcel just like quietly listened to his dad apologize profusely and talk about how they're going to reconnect and everything's how it's supposed to be now and i always knew you had potential and marcel ate dinner and then just like abruptly stood up and said i'm expecting elsewhere and like (laughs) left the fucking building i'm being paged (laughs) bye (laughs) So I thought I found that comical. Anyway, 
So, armed with his new uh, less than a year long medical degree, it is 1921, he ro- relocates to the town of Villeneuve, which is a small village only 25 miles from Auxerre, where he spent most of his childhood. And he rented this tiny house and he started strategizing how he's going to, you know, get his practice together and open up, you know, a medical facility. So he starts making these flyers and he's printing these flyers, having them printed to sort of advertise this new practice that he's opening. And listen, listen to what they say. Dr. Petio is young and only a young doctor can keep up to date on the latest methods born of a progress which marches in giant strides. This is why intelligent patients have confidence in him. Dr. Petio treats, but does not exploit his patients. Wow. That fucking last line. Boast much? I'm not going to exploit you. But I will treat you. But I will treat you. Don't worry. I will not exploit you i repeat i will not take advantage so what does he do of you <laughs> so what does he do i just thought it was so funny that he specifically put <laughs> wow so apparently the flyers worked though because he becomes very popular very fast and he was offering very affordable rates extended hours and this gave access to care to a lot of people who really may not have been able to afford it otherwise so I mean, good for him i mean he did start Bring like you know with uh you know maybe good intention or maybe it was just a business strategy um people reported that they felt he was super sharp super quick he was very devoted he would make house calls even really far away he would like make arrangements to travel and see people that were far away on very short notice so he seemed like you know, very accessible and very devoted guy. Some of his loyal patients would say it was like he just like knew what ailment they were coming in with even before they opened their mouths to talk to him. Like he was just very intuitive. He seemed to know what to do about every single little thing that came in. Because was he making it up? Well, Probably. probably. And as it turns out, he was not like as much of a selfless hero as people thought he was because he was enrolling every single one of his patients into medical assistance programs without their knowledge. Huh. I repeat. Wait a minute. I do not exploit (laughs) my patients. So essentially these programs exist to give the underserved a way to pay for medical care if they need it. So by enrolling them by in enrolling what again? in a medical assistance program, which is like a government funded. OK, but no, it was like a federally funded medical yes. assistance financial program, right. because then the state would pay him directly for yeah. his services. But he was doing this for every single one of his patients. Most of his patients did not need. Now I fully did not qualify. And he was falsifying documents and enrolling all of them. So many times was being paid by the patients and then by the state for one encounter. Can't do that. You can't. He does not explore his patients. Does not do it was that. in writing, it, Kate. He meant it. It was on the flyer, Devin. <laughs> <laughs> it was wild. It's just, this, is, this is just such a story, you guys. So pharmacists in the area also started noticing that his prescriptions were a little whack like he would almost always prescribe a potent narcotic like to like everyone like you got a cold why oh, not? you know here's some you know whatever morphine like a lot of morphine here take that you'll breathe better you'll just sleep right through that cold for six weeks and wake up feeling great did um, they, but did the pharmacist fill them well uh, not always and a Good. lot of them questioned him and we'll get into it um, excuse me, I'm burping. Oh, yuck. So, there is an incident on record wherein a pharmacist called Petio because he had prescribed an absolutely lethal dose of morphine. Like, would have killed maybe lots of horses if if we had oh, given gosh. that. Like, a ridiculous amount of morphine. And I, mean, I suppose in eight <clears throat> months you can't really pay that much attention to the pharmacological course. I mean, right? eight months. Pharmacology. Maybe he just added a zero or two. Sure. 
Yeah, like he meant the one milligram, but then it came at 100 milligrams. I don't know. No don't big know. deal. So another incident was similar. He had prescribed a dose to a child that would have killed an oh, adult no. man easily, easily God. killed an adult man. So obviously the pharmacist picks up the phone and he calls Petio to have him correct it. And Petio reportedly replied to this guy, quote, what difference does it make? Why not do away with this kid who is doing nothing in life but pestering his mother? End quote. What? So. What? 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 So I think that's what he's really thinking about all these people. And that's what he's really thinking all the time about everybody. And he just does not give a flying fuck. So he's just, here we go. Let's just give give him morphine, make everybody happy. Mm -hmm. Gosh. So it's entirely possible that people could have just died, you know, overdosed with. And I'm sure, you know, back at this point, too, 100 years ago, it's not like, I mean, I'm sure it's not like we had the plethora of narcotic choices that we do now either. Exactly. So it's. Exactly. So he had somehow found a way to be socially acceptable on the surface and be able to function in a work environment with employees and in an office setting. And him. seemingly thrive in a medical practice from a social standpoint, though, like outside of work. He really did not have friends, did not attend gatherings. He, no, no one ever really, no one saw him out. He never really made relationships. They never even saw him like at cafes or stores or anything. Not at the cafe. <laughs> I know, right? Wow. Jesus. There were really, um, so there were a few like fellow physicians and pharmacists who he knew in the community who felt like they knew him just like maybe slightly beyond a collegiate capacity. So they like, you know, had more, more than an average conversation with him. And these people all stated that the few times that they got like, quote unquote, friendly with him, he seemed very manipulative. He, uh, everything that he said was in an effort to steer the conversation or steer someone's opinion. Um, He would talk about the need to have a powerful position in life, the need to be on top. He seemed to, at least in these brief encounters, really enjoy gaslighting people, manipulating them just to fuck with people, just genuinely, always, constantly fucked with people. So... It seems like he just knew how to create doubt, even when it's completely unfounded. Like, people described it as he knew how to argue his points, even if they were completely illogical. He should and, have gone in, into law instead. Well, that's what it, it's like a narcissism behavior, right. like a per, like a perfect narcissism behavior. Like, my point is completely illogical, but I'm still going to somehow make you question your sanity. Turn it around on you. Exactly. And that's, he was so good at that. The pe- the few people that knew him enough that they knew just below the surface were like, this guy's, he's something, there's something under there. Like he, like very, Those kind of very people are manipulative. special kind of people. Yes, that they are. That make you question yourself. Yes. Ugh. Yes. Those who saw his estate and where he lived reported that he lived very modestly for a man in his position, never really had expensive clothes, never had an extravagant house, never really ate expensive foods. He did have an older lady come and clean his house once in a while and deliver groceries. But beyond that, he lived like pretty simply. One... I wonder what kind of stuff she saw. In the house. I know. I would love to know. Love to know. I'm sure she saw some stuff. Um, he was very heavily into politics and history, and he would read like voraciously, just book after book after book nonstop. I mean, if you think about it, he really never went anywhere, never had relationships. So when he wasn't working, he was just like reading nonstop. Now, the years pass on and around 1926, he employs a new housekeeper by the name of Louisette Delavo. She was 26 gorgeous. I was and, just going to say she sounds beautiful. Yeah, I know. By the name. Delibo. She was gorgeous. She was the daughter of a patient of his, actually, which is how the two got introduced. Her mom was um, a little older and a patient of his. Now, quickly after she began working in the house, the two began a relationship. He finally has a relationship. This was a big change. He's never had a relationship with anyone or shown any interest in women prior to this whatsoever. 
apart Ew. from being a little hypersexual when he was younger. Now, did that die off? You know, uh, I hadn't really seen it talked about it again, so maybe, but maybe he just learned how to keep it away from the public eye, is my guess. Now, this relationship continues for several months. His acquaintances even felt like he was brighter and happier than normal while he was in this relationship. Um, within a few months, Louisette starts gaining a little bit of weight, and a rumor starts circulating around town that the doctor's new girlfriend is pregnant. Uh oh. Now, days after this rumor starts circulating, Louisette vanishes without a trace. <gasps> No. Mm hmm. Now, while attending a gathering after her disappearance, one of the police constables was approached by Dr. Petio and asked, uh, Dr. Petio asked him, Hey, are, there, are any of the townspeople suspicious about the sudden disappearance of Louisette? Which the interaction apparently struck him enough that he mentioned the interaction to his chief because he was like, Why the hell would this guy come up to me? fishing for information to see if we're suspicious about her disappearance um so he was like suspicious right. enough of that i mean kind of yeah. oh, wow. um don't be suspicious don't be <laughs> suspicious so the police chief says you know what now that you mention it i'm pretty sure i saw him dr Petio, loading a large trunk into the back of his car like a few days ago uh-oh of course, at the time, he thought nothing of it. Why would he? Because Louisette hadn't, like, formally disappeared yet, or no one really realized it yet. Now, the following is a little rough, so please beware. Uh-oh. Not long afterwards, a similar trunk to what was described was pulled from the river, uh -oh. and it contained the beheaded corpse of a young woman. Of course... Her head was not there, and it was not recovered during the search. There was really no way to identify her without her head. Dr. Petio was so highly respected in the Which community. He clearly knew, he clearly yeah, knew that. Of course, yeah. of course. He was so highly respected in the community that no serious accusations were made against him, despite some pretty intense circumstantial evidence being there. Like, for was me... this beheaded body with child? It was not released huh. mm -hmm. following louisette's disappearance he starts pouring himself back into reading and a lot of that subject matter is politics some history mostly politics he suddenly announces that he wants to run for office <laughs> because why, why, why the not? fuck not the following month marcel petio was listed on the ballot running for mayor of the town of villeneuve now, Petio is somehow an outstanding speaker, actor, electrifying in front of an audience. You know, he's he's just got this external, you know, facade nailed to a T. I mean, if he speaks as well as he writes flyers, then he's got a, he's <laughs> he's a shoe in. <laughs> he's gonna do it exactly. <laughs> The man is a poet with flyers. <laughs> of course, he's a good speaker. He, you know, is on the campaign trail. He starts giving speech after speech. Each time, crowds are like, you know, just floored by him. He's giving these electrifying speeches. And he is making a real name for himself. And he's really giving his opponent a run for his money. Now, the campaign starts to near its close. And he was set to deliver a speech against his opponent. He went out. He uh, bought himself a spool of copper wire, wrote out detailed instructions, hired a young man to carry out a scheme. So Marcel does his speech first at the town hall, gets lots of oohs and ahs. He does great. And as his opponent takes the podium to give his rebuttal, suddenly everyone hears a pop and the power cuts out. Not just the, the town hall, but the rest of the town. Oh, boy. Power is completely out. Blackout. So later on, it comes to light that he had pained someone to short out the town's entire power grid just to prevent him from his opponent from giving his speech. <sighs> 
this power surge even started a few fires in the area. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it was super dangerous situation. So his opponent's speech was cut way short. I mean, he really only had moments. Sorry, dude. And missing this speech was so damaging to his campaign that he dropped out of the mayoral race. And Petio was elected mayor of Villeneuve in July 1926. Uh-huh. So now the guy's a doctor. And a mayor. Dr. Mayor. Dr. Mayor. Well, that was good. You're welcome. I picture Puss in Boots with that one. I know. Dr. Mayor. <laughs> of course, he's abusing his mayoral power. Yeah. Shocker. <laughs> he was accused at one point of embezzling town funds. And get this. He discloses to some people working for his campaign and working in his office that the whole, quote, insanity thing from the military was faked. Yeah, right. He faked all of his mental health issues. For what purpose? To get out of being drafted into the military. That what? entire time. Stop. He was trying to get out of the military and get out of being held accountable for any of the petty crimes that he committed. I think that would make people not want him as their mayor. You would think, but he's already been elected as mayor. So, I mean, he shot himself in the fucking foot. If this This, was fake. He's he's a villain. But. The public's now seeing that, right? Like, they're seeing, like, who is this guy? So, I mean, it makes sense. It seems excessive. And, like, are you kidding? There's no way that's fake. But it makes sense because... Look at his track record. I mean, this guy is so good at putting on yeah, but it a didn't fucking work. show. It did eventually work. It did eventually because work to get him discharged get yeah. from the military. And it did work, the whole insanity thing, to get his charges dropped when he was younger before the military. And I think he saw that and thought to himself, you know what? Every time I run, have a run-in with the law, I'm just going to fake insanity. They're going to deem me unable so to make my own decisions. Can you can you then change someone's military discharge? Great question. I have no idea how that works or how it worked back then. Like, can you backtrack that shit? There's an avalanche of children upstairs. And then change it to dishonorable? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. And then let him le- lose his mayoral spot mm-hmm. and put him in hell where he belongs? I mean... Can that happen? It's also possible that it was not fake. And maybe somebody found out about his discharge and his past mental health struggles, and he is just trying to save face by saying, hey, that was all fake. But, I mean, people with ASPD are so incredibly manipulative and so committed to the facades that they put on that it, this is what they do. It would make sense. Well. Wow is all I have to say. That just threw a wrench into my I know. Stuff. I'm telling you, for a minute, you start to feel bad for him. Well, you no, think I hadn't maybe felt I feel bad. bad. For, no, I hadn't felt bad The for mental him, health but... stuff, I was feeling bad. And then I read that and was like, bro, if that was all fake, like, wow. Just wow. And also, I've never, never feel bad for you. <sighs> it was widely believed that he was truly sick and that he didn't fake any of that. I mean, there were a lot of doctors that examined him thoroughly and all came up with the same, you know, diagnosis. But if he did, bravo, dude. What a fucking performance. Uh, that <sighs> Encore. Not. So, while he was in office, he was a bit of a klepto. Um, he was accused of stealing stupid little things here and there. Like, I mean, he could have, you know, a lot of it was like petty and stupid. Like, someone would make him mad. And then he would just go take something of theirs and it would just like turn up having been donated somewhere or sold to someone. That was just for a cheap thrill. Yeah, I mean, it was just for a cheap thrill. Again, another ASPD thing. Like Mm -hmm. these people, in order to feel something, will do stuff like that. In 1927, he meets and marries the daughter of a wealthy landover from a landowner, excuse me, from oh, he did a neighboring get married. town. He did get married. Her name was Georgette Valentine Leblay, and she was young. She was only 23 at the time, and of course, gorgeous, one of the prettiest girls say. in town. Yes. And the two lived together in apparent happiness for the following several years. 
Now, fast forward to 1930. So we're like another three, four years into the future here. An event happened in their tiny hometown of Villeneuve that would rock everyone for years. Now, this was a tiny, quiet village. There was This population was, I think, 4,200 people. Very small village. A prominent member of the community named Armand de Beauve returns home one evening around 8 p.m. to discover that his home is engulfed in flames. Oh. Now, Armand was the director of the local dairy cooperative. Everyone knew him and his wife. Um, he, he often handled large business transactions as, par- as part of his day-to-day. And he managed the flow of dairy product and relationships with a bunch of local farmers. Like, everybody knew this guy. Yeah. And he was, you know, the director of this program. So he gets home. He discovers his house on fire. Immediately, he calls for help. He doesn't see his wife outside, so he busts into the house, running in through the kitchen to try to find his wife. He finds his wife, Henriette de Beauve, on the floor, gasping for air. He picks her up, rushes her outside. Help arrives. So we have fire and emergency medical people there at this point. Help arrives and rescue efforts are started on Madame Dubove. But as they are attempting to ventilate her, they realize that one side of her head is completely caved in. Oh, no. Completely caved in. Seemingly from some kind of massive blunt blunt force force trauma. And... What Armand didn't discover until that moment was that she was covered in blood, head to toe, was covered in blood. And in the rush to get her out of the house, hadn't noticed that the area around her was Was heavily stained in blood. And there was spatter on the ceiling, on the walls, everywhere. So they noticed, you know, they noticed all of this. Firemen are extinguishing the blaze investigators get there and obviously this is you know a a violent attack and definitely foul play here so they immediately are launching an investigation they go inside and see these unburnt areas that are just covered in blood these staining and spatter patterns all over the walls you know obviously something really violent happened here unfortunately despite rescue efforts henriette de beauve died on the scene from her injuries no she did not now, of course, it's spectate. This isn't a super, super remote area, so some spectators had started to gather around the place. The spectators were, of course, Doctor Petio and his wife. They were reportedly on their way to the movies, and they saw the blaze. They stopped. They were seen getting out of the car at the time for a brief period and kind of watching things unfold before returning to the vehicle and heading to the movies. This didn't really strike anyone as real odd because. You know, A, he's one of the town's few physicians. You know, yeah. he thought this is an emergency. And B, he's the mayor of the right. town. You know, two reasons why two he reasons. would need to be there. So yeah. nobody really thought this was odd. You know, they thought, oh, there's, you know, there's Dr. Petio checking on this horrible thing. And he probably made some remarks and was on his way. Um, Now, witnesses who saw him at the movies later that night felt that he seemed very unlike himself was very nervous, was like twitchy, distracted, and was just like not enjoying the movie because he was just so, you know, out of sorts. Yeah. So um, immediately this investigation begins on the scene. Now, investigators noted a series of things. First of all, there is a set of footprints leading away from the house, from behind the house, into a marshy area and then continuing along a river that runs behind the Dubove's home and a few other homes on that road. This um, set of footprints continues for about a mile into like the busier section of the actual village of Villeneuve. Um, Now, somebody to have been able to navigate that in the dark, because this had obviously just happened, um, and do it well without like falling in the river or stumbling or having a wandery pattern must have known the area very well. Okay. Um, they also noticed that there was gasoline poured all within the house and all around the house, like uh, obviously being used as an yeah, accelerant. Yeah. So it became apparent that, you know, whoever did this murdered her and was burning down the house in order to conceal For the what crime. Reason? We're getting there. Now, investigators knew that the murderer 
would have been close to the family or have studied them quite well because for a few reasons because whoever committed this crime would a have needed to know that Armand went to the local cafe every single night and didn't return home until 7:45 8 o'clock they noted that the heat of the fire had made the clock in the kitchen stop at 7:13 so the blaze had started you know, maybe started in the kitchen and stopped the clock at 7.13. So she was killed, you know, maybe slightly before that, giving a little bit of a timeline. Additionally, the killer would have known that the second Wednesday of every month that happened to be this day, Armand would need to make payment for the milk that they collected from the farmers in neighboring areas. And on this particular day of the month, the Duboves have an unusually large stash of cash in their Aww. home. The fact that this happened to be on that day of the month for the Duboves led investigators to believe that this was, you know, obviously a financially right, right. motivated crime. So the amount of money that he would have had in the house would have been around 235,000 francs. Or today, that would have been the equivalent of, of around $719,000 in U.S. Whoa. dollars. So, I mean, a lot of cash to have. Yes. Um, on your person at any given time. Now, the route, the house had definitely been ransacked. It had been searched. So another clue that they were like, they were looking for this money. Yes, yes. The killer looked pretty vigorously, but Armand had the wherewithal to hide the cash very well. And the killer did not succeed in finding that big <gasps> cash pot. The money However, was succeeded in killing, in killing his, wife. his wife, unfortunately. The money was hidden under a bunch of kitchen cabinets. So like nowhere you would just like look when you're looking for money. Wow. Um, the killer had looked in closets. He had forced open a couple of safes. And um, in one closet, he did end up finding a smaller stash of money, um, about 20,000 francs, which he did take. And while, it, while searching the closet, the killer did leave behind three bloody fingerprints on a cardboard uh-huh. box. So, on a search of the property, they found a hammer in the river behind the house. And they pulled this hammer out of the river, and they determined that the wounds on Henriette's head matched the end of the hammer. I mean, perfectly. But unfortunately, the hammer was in the river for about a day before they finally uncovered it. And of course, any physical evidence, any fingerprints, anything like that would have been totally washed away. Um... Now, investigators had a weapon. They had a potential motive, but unfortunately were left at a dead end beyond that. As far as a suspect. Exactly, because there were no witnesses to the crime. They had no fingerprint matches on file for the fingerprints that they had. Now, this town is in absolute shock. Absolute shock. And the 4,200 inhabitants of the town were all thinking, Jesus, you know, my na- you know, I know all of these people. One of these people that I know is a murderer. It could be my neighbor. You know, who the hell knows? It could be this guy walking at me down the street. Oh. Tips start pouring into authorities. Most of them were just very wrong, very misleading. This obviously blows up into like a media frenzy. Um, a man even accused the man his wife was having an affair with of committing the crime. Just I mean, to, why not? I mean, right Let's... at that point. Um, and even like reported him to the police, like made a formal accusation to that, which was obviously bullshit. They had a couple of suspects here and there that were just like kind of petty thieves from the area. And like they, they had done some like light burglary stuff and nothing that could re- they could really make stick. So. The police are left with no choice but to kind of just like check out all these tips and hopefully something good comes along. Suddenly, a series of articles are published in the town's newspaper, beginning with essentially dragging the police, taunting them um, that the murder would in all likelihood remain completely unsolved. And that, you know, the police are moving so slow. They're not following up on leads. They're not doing their jobs. You guys are, you know, just totally tearing them down. The articles then begin to evolve and start describing details of the crime scene, the murder weapon, the nature of the wounds, things that were absolutely not released. Really, only the police and the medical medical examiner would have known anything about this. And Petio was not at all involved with a medical examination of this case at all. So... 
police go to the paper. Like, obviously, whoever's writing this has some right. inside information at the very least. So these articles to be put with a request to publish the articles were mailed without postmark or return address. They were not able to trace the letters. They were a- unable to lift any fingerprints from the letters. There was nothing on the letters that could trace back to who originally Ooh. wrote them. Another it's dead like end. Taunting them. I know. Exactly. Now, years later, when his later misdeeds are uncovered, it was discovered that Dr. Mel- Marcel Petio wrote these articles and sent them into the paper to be published. <gasps> and that. How'd they figure that out? Uh, I'll get to it in part two slash three slash maybe four. I know. Cliffhanger. I know. You guys, this gets so insane and I cannot wait to bring you the next installment. My because legs it's are wild. swinging and I'm like at the edge of my seat. It's like, wild, come on, come right? On, come on. Ugh. This case has, I was has into been a lot. It. Yeah, I, I know. I was into it too, like reading all about it. It's it's just been such a ride. Crazy. But I'm glad I get to bring it to you guys. This is going to be um an interesting one. This so is going to be a like long it. sesh. I know. I know. <sighs> mm-hmm. Thanks, Kate. You're welcome. How's everybody else doing? Anybody else got goosebumps? I mean, anybody else got like ah? I know I do, but mostly because it's cold in my basement. Well, there's, there's that. that. Mm-hmm. Thanks everyone for listening. If you want to continue to see what we're doing, you can follow us on Instagram at Med Crimes Podcast. You can tweet at us at Med Crimes PC, but I can't promise I'll see it because I honestly have not logged into our Twitter in like a couple of weeks. So if anybody has reached out, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm bad at Twitter. You can find us on Facebook at Med Crimes Podcast. Or we do you, see those. We see those all the time. That and Insta. And if you wish to become a Patreon, feel free to follow us at www.patreon.com slash medcrimespodcast. You want to be part of Break Room Banter Episode 2. I mean, which who we're doesn't want get... to be a part of that? Yeah, hello. <laughs> we're getting ready to gear up to do another one. Please send us your crazy stories, anything you care to share, at Wee. medcrimes at gmail.com. We love you guys. We can't wait to hear from you. And please stay safe out there. Thanks for listening. Mwah.